Welcome to The Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Atchison. Today's guest is Walter Learning. I invite you to Google Walter. He has lived a life full of magic and wonder with how the pieces of his life have unfolded and his contributions to our community and to our province. We really hope you enjoy the interview because there was magic happening as we talked. If you like the show, please support it by clicking the Patreon link in the upper right corner or by sharing it through your networks. And now, here's Walter. Pay attention, something was happening. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure, sir. Um, stories to be told, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah, so why don't we start with the beard and, and all of that, because uh, it's a great way to introduce the audience to oh. Mr. Learning and, and his adventures. Uh, Walter, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm uh, doing Chris Kringle in a production of Miracle on 34th Street up at Magnus Theater in Thunder Bay. So I have to grow all this stuff through the summer to be ready for <laughs> November. And this will be the fourth time. It started at the Theater in New Brunswick here in Fredericton. Okay. Caleb Marshall did the adaptation. Uh, then I did it in Sudbury. And then I did it last year in Orangeville. So fourth time. Fourth time. I'll get it right soon. <laughs> Oh. It must be fascinating um, with always having a new cast to work with. It is. It really is. Uh, the uh, The first time, uh, the second time, we had a lot of the same people. But then number three, a lot of different people. And I'm sure this one would be a lot. Of, and that's really interesting. And I come, because I'm blind, uh, I have to learn all my lines before the first day of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. uh, because I have a, a computer program called uh, Natural Speaking, okay. uh, which converts my text to speech or to an MP3. Really? And that's how I learned the line. So the first day of rehearsal, I'm about 85 or 90 percent there, uh, which annoys some of the cast because they feel, <laughs> well, we should be off book now. And yeah. I, I assure them, look. <laughs> I'm at the stage that you will be at when you get off book in a week and a half to two weeks. Yeah. So, yeah. Following that theme, um, a lot of people don't know how um, plays. It's a peek behind the scenes. It's like going into the dressing room of a sports team. Mm -hmm. Can you take us to uh, what that um, off book process would be like, or or what it's like when the team first assembles and you get to <clears throat> feel the vibe off each other? Yeah, you, sit around you the do. Table and usually, read. usually uh, it starts at ten o'clock and. Uh, it's called the meet and greet, and you get together and you meet people. Some of if you've worked before, that's a particular vibe. If not, you're sort of watching everybody. And usually the staff of the theater is there, and you're introduced to them. And then they have the read-through, and they sit around the table and they read the script. Uh, now, that's something that I tend not to do anymore because I don't want to hold them up because I'm thinking through the lines so the stage manager, the assistant stage manager, will read for me. Okay. But every once in a while, I'll show off. And when it comes to one of the longer speeches, <laughs> I'll just do it. Here comes Walter. Yeah. And I'll, I'll never forget when uh, we, did a, we did a show uh, uh, called uh, Outlaw a number of years ago uh, with Norm Foster and, and David Nairn, the artistic director of Theatre Orangeville. And uh, we were going along, and it hit one of those monologues, which I did, and he just looked at me and said, you <laughs> bastard. <laughs> so, That's fun. Yeah. yeah. And, and so you move from the tabletop to... To what they call blocking. Okay. And you start, and uh, some people try to push it along and get as much of it blocked as possible, and that's really basically the basic movements. Mm -hmm. And you get that going. And then uh, the word for rehearsal in, in French is a repetition. Okay, good. And that's what you do. Yeah. That's what you do for weeks. Uh, and the normal oh. rehearsal period in our underfunded uh, theater world is uh, two and a half weeks. Goodness. Yeah. I mean, large companies like Stratford and Shaw, that they have much longer rehearsal periods. But in general, two and a half weeks hmm. from page to stage. Goodness. Yeah. And the paint will still be wet on some of the Absolutely. Of the <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> so, some people may be aware that you might perform the same play every night for a run of three weeks. Or mm -hmm. yeah. But every night the play is different. Oh, yeah. Because, Share with us. Yeah, because the other element is there, and the other element is the audience. Mm -hmm. And every audience is different. And it's not that they're good, bad, or 
Yeah. And different. It's just that they're different, and they inform. It's interesting when uh, we play the student matinees. Normally, somebody talks with the students beforehand, and tell them the difference between watching a play and watching a film, where no matter what you do in the cinema, does not affect what is happening on that screen, but what you do in the theater, live theater, affects incredibly what is happening. On the stage, and so that's the symbiotic relationship yep. that's so important and makes theater different than just about anything else. Yep, um, I've at times thought that there should be training for audiences um, to know the difference <clears throat> in the different performances, to give some love back, to give some energy back, yep. so yep. that the people on the stage who are working hard but they can't quite see through the light, yep. so they're waiting for yeah. that that feel to come through. Well, there are various ways of educating. <laughs> <laughs> when I, uh, the first year I, I took over the Charlottetown Festival, 1987, uh, they usually started the uh, season there with a number of previews, uh, school previews for Anna Green Gables. Okay. They had become notorious because apparently the students were really, really ill-behaved, okay. would throw things, throw coins, no big coins, but small coins uh, on the stage. And I was warned about this. And I said, well, has anybody ever gone out and talked? Oh, yeah. Every year we go out and talk with them. So I said, OK, we need a new approach. So at the first matinee, I went to the prop shop. And I found from a production of I'll Be Back Before Midnight that we were going to do a 12-gauge shotgun. And so I walked out to do the pre-show talk just cradling the 12-gauge shotgun in my arms. And I just spoke to them and said, you know, about the relationship between the audience and all the rest of it. Never referenced the shotgun once. And then thanked them very much, turned off. We had no trouble. <laughs> Walter, that's teeny. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did get a call from one parent. Yeah. Yes, yes. I imagine. But uh, no, there was no threat, no yeah. nothing. There was just carrying a prop. But, but just in, in terms of that relationship with audience, the interaction with audience, and audience needing to understand their energy in the room, will have an awful lot to do with oh, what yeah. happens on the stage. Sports world gets it. You go to a hockey Absolutely. game and, and they'll start rallying their team, yeah. they'll crank people up, you know? Yes. Um, same yes. thing for yep. theater. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, that's why, you know, in comedy, that's why the laugh hmm. is so uh, enervating. I mean, it just lifts you. Yeah. You know, or that great pause or that great silence. It all, you know. Yeah, when you've touched them yeah, and you got them and you know it. Do you, have, do you have a for instance? Oh, that pops up where either you got them or the laugh or the dud, you know, where uh, this is supposed to pause here for laughter, uh, no laughter follows. Well, I tell you, the, the one of the things that you learn very quickly if you know you have a funny line, and if during the playing of that coming up the line, you for a, an instant start and in your head you go, Okay, I'm coming up to the good one now. It'll die. It will absolutely die because you, you've come out of it. Mm. You, your focus is gone. Mm. And you must never, ever, you have to, I mean, talk about being in the moment. That's, that's what it is. You yeah. have to be there. And uh, if you start seeing yourself or hearing yourself, you're in trouble. You're, you're tweaking on an interesting shift in perception because it, being in the moment, being present, which is you're just in the play. Yeah. And you're not thinking about the impact of the play or the consequence of the play or the consequence of a line. That's a, that's a transcendent moment. It is. It is. And th th I mean, there is a duality about it. Uh, you can feel the reaction, but still be in the play. Hmm. I'm very much in the play. And uh, you no, know, the great Canadian actor, William Hutt, who I had the honor and the pleasure of working with six times over the uh, number of years. And <laughs> Bill used, half jestingly used to say, there's no secret to great acting. All you have to do is tell the truth. Once you learn how to fake that, you've got it knocked. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> you know, wow. it is. Because there is the, <laughs> there is the artifice in art mm. as well, you know, mm -hmm. so... And, yeah, uh, because it is a touch of a double, a double awareness, a double, a double perception. Yeah. Uh, 
so I've taken you a touch astray. So do you have some uh, anecdotes or moments where things were clicking and the audience was riding the wave with you and, and it was one of those nights that just, you wish you could do it like that every night? Oh, that does happen, yes. yeah. Those are not really the ones that you remember. The ones, oh. the ones that you remember are the mistakes. Like it, you're playing in a farce, which I was doing, I've done many farces, and I was doing a farce in uh, Upper Canada Playhouse a couple of years ago. And there's a scene where I enter and I'm completely and totally out of breath. I've rushed into the room. And I do my setup off stage. And I'm all set. I hear my cue and I rush up and I'm at the door and I realized I've come in two pages early. <laughs> and I hang on to that door and I do the, the heavy breathing and I you know, do and the Three other people on stage are wondering, what the hell is Hardy doing? Walter doing? What's he doing there? And all I'm doing is dying and playing that I'm so out of breath from coming up the stairs that I I last the page and a half. <laughs> Those you remember. <laughs> and, every, and that's that bit where and they, they just adjusted. Oh, yeah. The yeah they, they just, what the hell is he doing? And they just kept on going. And then uh, my cue came up and I... I'm did ready my thing. I came my right in. Now. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So. oh, that's fun. Oh, yeah. And the audience, of course, none the wiser. No, nope. they generally have no idea. Yeah. They generally have no idea. Uh, How's the theater community, in your view, in Canada today? Are, are we humming? Or, I think, or has it got more to go? Uh, well, there's always more to go. Um, I think a lot of the theaters are redefining themselves. Hmm. We had that we had that uh, wonderful growth period from the '60s, up where we established across the country what was affectionately known as the string of pearls, okay. and those were what they called the regional theaters. Yes, you had your Neptune Theater, you had in New Brunswick, you had the theaters in Montreal, you had Toronto, Manitoba Theater Center, Theater Calgary, Vancouver Playhouse. Yep, those were called the string of pearls, and they were. They were called um, regional theaters. Now, interestingly, each of them served a region, but they were solo based in the city. Mm -hmm. The only true regional theater in Canada at the time, from 1969 on, was Theatre New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. It toured the province. It played all the small towns, plus it toured Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland, yes, yeah. and Ontario. Uh, but it was a true regional theater in that it just circled the province. Yep. And, uh, you know, over the years the, that uh, that changed and, and it's redefining itself now to, uh, to what the reality is now. Uh, when those companies were founded in the early 60s, mid 60s, uh, there was no such thing as a VCR or a beta. That came along a little bit later. Yep. And... Uh, and television wasn't, you know, uh, you didn't have 10 screens at your local cinema. You know, in Fredericton, you had two mm. places. That was it. Yep. Uh, so uh, there wasn't a lot of things uh, that you were competing against. So you developed an audience. And I think <coughs> for, for uh, a TMB at that time, our real strength was uh, what we called uh, the uh, Theatre New Brunswick uh, support groups around the province. And those were the local groups, mm -hmm. 8, 10, 12, 14 people who uh, sold the tickets in that community, who used their Christmas card list and sold the subscriptions to their friends on the phone. Yeah. They did it all. They were really, really just great. And is that all gone by the wayside these days? Yeah, I, I, it has to a certain extent. Uh, I think what happens, or what did happen after 20 years or whatever, is that uh, it's sort of like a kid growing up and no longer depending on the parent, and you're going to do it yourself. And so you don't have that close a connection any longer with the community, you visit the community as opposed to being part of the community. And I was very big on the ownership of us 
in those communities. I mean, when, for example, the Playhouse, uh, when we did the two and a half million dollar renovation in the early 70s, <clears throat> and we had to close it for a year, mm -hmm. a group came from Campbellton and said, uh, you don't play Campbellton, we want you to play Campbellton. And I said, well, uh, actually, we're going to have to close the theater for a year, so I'm not sure that we're going to be able to produce a season. And they said, well, why not? And I said, well, we need a theater in the shop, you know, to build yeah. our sets. And they said, well, we have a brand new school with an 800-seat theater, and we have a shop. Why don't you come to Camelton? And I thought, this is crazy. <laughs> and off we went to Camelton in January, and we did three shows out of Camelton. We toured the province. When we came to Fredericton, we played Base Gage Town, the theater in Base Gage Town. Great. But that was the basis of, of the community. And I'll never forget getting a, a visit by a nun and a school principal, a lady from Edmonds. And they said, we want theater in Brunswick to come and play in our, we have a lovely theater here. Yeah. And I said, well, uh, we, don't, we don't encroach on the Francophone community because they have their own theater and uh, we have a couple of companies. And they said, oh, no, no, no. We get lots of theater in French. What we want to expose our students to is theater in English. Okay. And so we started going to Edmonds. And this becomes an example of another one of those marvelous stories in New Brunswick of cultural communities working together. Absolutely. And building building a cross-pollination in a culture and a narrative yeah. that, that mainstream media just doesn't seem to reflect anymore. I know. I know. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. I think there will be a lot of stories told over the next 12 months because next year, is the 50th anniversary of Theatre New Brunswick. Yeah. So I think uh, a lot of people will be talking about it. And uh, I think they've uh, they've gotten a bit wise in that normally they do the big program or the book, you know, with all the pictures and all the rest of it. And I think they're beginning to realize the power of the social media. Yep. Yes. <sighs> what you can do. Yes. You know, yes. so the first thing they're doing, I think they're doing a blog. Good. Then they'll start with the video. Then there's, you know, good. Yeah, I'd like to pull it back a little bit sure. about about um, the theater's impact on a community. Mm -hmm. um, so to frame it a bit, we're in for a lot of social change in the next twenty or yeah. thirty years. Um, systems are breaking down, whether it's banking systems, environmental systems. We're looking for where to move next, mm -hmm. or how do we make sense of the chaos and and create some vision and direction. Oftentimes, it's the artists in a community who know how to interpret our narrative, show us our narrative back to us, mm -hmm. and help us find who we are as a, as a people. So do you think that there might be a renaissance or a return at some point of the power of theater in, in New Brunswick or Canada to help us make our way and make sense and stay connected with each other? Oh. As, as all these big systems shift global yeah. environmental systems. Well, I think, I think that is possible because of the uniqueness of the experience. Hmm. Give me one example. When I was leaving the Theatre of New Brunswick in 1978, I used to always go out on the tour, but I went out to say goodbye and thank you to all the local groups that I had worked with over those 10 years. Hmm. And we're in Sussex, where there was a wonderful teacher named Jean Hodnott, who organized the local support group there. And we always had a little get together after the show where they bake goods and everything. Yeah. There. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm there, and there are 150, 200 people. And this man comes up to me, and a very unassuming a farmer yeah. in Sussex. He comes up to me, and he said, uh, I just want to thank you, he said, uh, because he said, you know, I saw one of your plays early on, and it, it changed my life. And I said, really? What, what play was that? And he said, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Hmm. And I was gobstruck. Mm -hmm. I thought, what was happening in that man's life, mm -hmm. in that little community of Sussex, that this American play mm -hmm. about this incredibly angry couple mm -hmm. <laughs> had touched him and changed his life in some way. Mm. Now, 
Seldom will you ever know how the effect has changed or done it. Yeah. But you know it does. Mm -hmm. It really does. And, and that's enough? Oh, that's great payback, <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you. I'll give you one other. Good. My collaborator, Alden Nolan, who we broke five stage plays and a number of television shows together over a period of time. Alden was commissioned to do a history of Campobello Island, which is still in print. And he came back. We were sitting and having a drink one day, and he said, I found this amazing thing in the ex-governor of Campobello. I forget what they called him. It wasn't Governor Plotentan plenipotentiary or something like that. Okay. And he said, I found this reference in it that at the local auction, there was a woman who was so beautiful, she was sold for a dollar. And we thought, wow, what would that be? So we started inventing a play about how could this come about. So we said, okay, uh, her husband, they owned the pub, okay, and there's a and he went broke, and we did all of this. And somehow or other, while doing some of the research, I found a reference to the pauper auctions in Cardwell County. And I had a friend at the museum in St. John, and I contacted him and I said, do you know anything about that? And he said, let me check. And he came back and he said, we have the book of the overseer of the poor for the parish of Cardwell here. And it covers three generations. And I said, book? He said, yes. I said, could I see it? So I went down. Here was this book. And in this book were all the transactions at the annual pauper auction that happened in Sussex over three generations. And the overseer of the poor, the family name was McCready. And I thought, what is this? And I came back home, and there was a name and another character in it who this woman, Maggie Harvey, seemed to be there every year bidding and taking uh, care of people for a very small amount of money. And so I came home, and I went, and I looked in the phone book, and I looked for the Sussex Penobscos, and I found a McCready in there. And I said, wow. So I phoned. And a lady answered, and I said, hello, my name is Walter Learning. I'm working on this book and uh, about the pauper auction uh, that were happening in Sussex. And uh, I noticed that the McCready's were the overseers of the poor. And she said, yes, my grandfather was the last overseer of the poor. And I said, oh, really, could I talk to you about that? And she said, well, it'd be better if you talked to him. And I said, what? And she said, yeah, he's here. He's in the kitchen. Uh, I said, well, could I come and see him? Absolutely, yes. Got in the car with my tape recorder, headed down, and I met this 90-year-old man, Louis J. McCready. And he told me the story right from when he was a 10-year-old boy attending the first auction that his father did, did the whole thing. I came back to Fredericton, went to all of them and said, tear up what we've done. Here's our, here's our play. And I played the tape for him when we started. Well... When we opened that show in Sussex, Mr. McCready was attending with his daughter, and I called her that morning and said, how's Lewis doing? She said, he's new from the skin out, she said. He's got <laughs> new underwear, he's got new shirt, he's got new, the whole thing. That auditorium that normally we played to in Sussex, imagine, 300 people there. That night they brought cheers from everywhere. We had almost 700 people in that audience. And Mr. McCready was sitting in the front row. And at the end of the show, when we took our bows and they did the bows, my son, who was seven, played the young boy in the, in the play. And Mr. McCready came up to him and said, did you know that was me you were playing? Great. You know, so lives, yes. lives changed. Yes. Yeah, amazing. The, yeah. And, and the power of theater, oh. like you brought us right back into that space. Today's um, entertainment world is so engrossed with technology. Why I asked about theater bringing us back to who we are, because it's one-on-one -on -one live yeah. Yeah. <laughs> compared yeah. to interface through Absolutely. a piece of technology. And I, I, we need to go back to being I'm together. Tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, help me here. I'm, I'm not quite clear on the pauper auction. Oh, uh, when uh, the parishes looked after the poor up until when the government got involved years later. And what would happen was they would bring the paupers together, the train station in Sussex, normally around New Year's, and they would request from those who attended to bid to say how much they would pay to look after a pauper for a year. Now, normally you'd bid, you know, I need $50 to look after so-and-so. Now, if it was a fellow who could work, well, I might take him for $30. But if it was a lovely young girl, you'd take her for a dollar. So that's the hook. Because you knew what happened, you know. And this Maggie Harvey, who was an incredible character, she was a big ma. She raised more pauper children who went on to become lawyers and doctors, went to the Boston States and became nurses. Just an amazing story. And uh, we used a number of the real names, and one of the real names was a man who was an absolute bastard and who was known to beat and starve the paupers. And when the name was mentioned in Sussex, you could hear the gasps. No. Get That's awesome. Isn't that? Yes, oh. because theater can go into the shadows. Oh, and yes. Bring it right out into the light. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, that was a proud moment. And uh, uh, Theater New Brunswick did the 30th anniversary production a, a couple of years ago at the Black Box. And I ended up playing in that. It was really great. Had a good time. It's a good show. So, yeah. so, did I miss it? The title of the show? The Dollar Woman. The Dollar Woman. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. By any chance, does it exist online yes. somewhere? Yeah, I can send you a copy. Okay, and we'll put the link in, oh, in, sure. the, in the yeah. show. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, we were very lucky uh, in those days because the CBC, uh, before, you know, being cut and shriveled and that, uh, we had a radio drama department in Halifax. Yes. You no, know, John Douglas, Elizabeth Fox, uh, and we had every year one of our stage plays was adapted for radio mm -hmm. and so they did the our frankenstein the incredible murder card and tosca the dollar woman the gift to last um, and uh, many others and the, with some of the wonderful people the dollar woman the stars a, a little old newfoundland actor named gordon pinson yeah. you know <laughs> and <laughs> They're there. All of that stuff is there. Yeah. One of the themes of the show is that we have so much talent in this province. We don't have places often to celebrate or share or tell people about the talent. Um, this is a classic example of our history, our narrative, and bringing it back into the present again. Is there a chance for a resurgence? Do you see a potential for a resurgence of theater? Given that people, you know, need to get together again. Yeah, I think so. It's interesting. Uh, you know, when we started Theatre New Brunswick, uh, there was uh, one community theatre group uh, in Fredericton called Theatre Fredericton. Hmm. Uh, now, you've got a half a dozen, mm -hmm. you know, young entrepreneurial folks, notable acts, mm -hmm. doing stuff. I mean. Peter Pacey, still out there with the Calathumpians, and yeah. you know, yeah. doing all that stuff. St. John and Moncton, do they have their versions, or up on the North Shore? Is yeah, it... uh, less so on the North Shore, but there is, a tr there is a long tradition in New Brunswick. There used to be what was called the New Brunswick Drama League, and that was uh, an outgrowth and support for what used to be the Dominion Drama Festival. Okay. which was a national organization, and it was for community theater, universities and that, and they had held national competitions every year. Mm -hmm. And when I was at UMB, uh, the Drama Society there was invited to at least three national um, things. Uh, it spawned a lot of the people who became the people who blew up in the 60s and mm -hmm. 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1967, I was uh, I was teaching uh, philosophy at Memorial University in St. John's, and they had just opened the New Arts and Cultural Center for 67. 
and the Minion Drama Festival had its final there. And that year they did all Canadian plays. And two of the things that were significant that year were a young 12-year-old boy playing in a play based on a novel by a Newfoundlander called Tomorrow Will Be Sunday. And his name was David Ferry, who's gone on to have quite a career. And the other was a boy a couple of years older who was in the play from Toronto and won Best Actor. And he went on to do pretty well, R.H. Thompson. Hmm. You know? Yep. So out of these things, things grow. Yes. And, you know, I'm sure that possibility is there. You've got Theatre St. John, which is very active there. Uh, Month, and you've, you've got Marshall doing his thing at the, uh, at the Capitol. Yep. And uh, they've got the theatre school there, as they do here. So, yeah, the need is there. The hunger is there. Yes. The hunger is there. Uh, I think if, if one is thinking about professionally, uh, one of the things that, that you had to get over pretty early on is that you were going to uh, make your living in one community. You can't. Yep. It's not New York. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You have to go where the work is. Yes. Yep. And that means you have to be a bit mobile. Or travel a bit. Travel a bit. Yep. But that's it, not unlike many other professions. Of course. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But somehow or other, there's a thing, uh, actors. <laughs> actors are strange people to begin with. <laughs> but, I'm glad uh, you said it, not uh, me. No. I mean, uh, we've had a classic example is Neptune. In Halifax, which has just announced a new new artistic director, Jeremy Webb, who came from England in the early 90s and has been a remarkable theater artist in that. But the big complaint with the outgoing artistic director was that here's all these local artists and, and, and he's bringing people in. Hmm. You know? Uh, yep. <laughs> sorry. When I moved to Vancouver to take over the playhouse there, uh, Roger Hodgman, who had preceded... Uh, uh, oh my god uh, it'll come to me in a second anyway yep. uh, they had a company a theater company they had actors on a full time contract well the rest of the community felt excluded from any work opportunities at this major regional theater and uh, Christopher Newton who was the artistic group who established that and he went on to Shaw he did the same thing again well I came in new and I said no I'm not going to have a permanent company I'm going to hire people and in that that first season I brought in Ted Follows I brought in Nick House I brought in Bill Hutt and Robin Phillips and the complaints went up oh my god not only did he get rid of the permanent company now he's bringing people in and I pointed out show me an actor who was born in Vancouver mm -hmm. No. Mm. They're all from Hawaii. Mm. Mm. <laughs> they all came there from somewhere. So That'll be, That's an interesting conundrum. Yeah. Because other industries have the same thing. It's like, don't take jobs away from locals. Or was, you'll, you'll see stuff about the temporary foreign worker program in yeah. industry. Yeah. Um, think there might ever come a time, and maybe theater can lead the way, where it's just about producing a good show or producing a good product, and you bring all the best yeah. talent you can gather for the yeah. budget you have to make that happen. Yeah, I think, I, I think uh, you know, as the same Newfoundland, the fish stinks from the head. <laughs> and it really, it's a comment about leadership, right? Yeah. And I think that that's where artistic directors and producers uh, have to stamp it, mm -hmm. stamp it with approval and saying, hey, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets a chance. Everybody auditions. Yes. I still go to auditions. Yeah. And my agent keeps saying, Walter, you're too old and too stupid to be going out to general auditions. I said, oh, no, no. Oh, it's part of the These process. People don't know me. Yeah. So you go out and you do your thing. And if you get lucky, you get hired. Yeah. There's a, a humbleness to the whole process that's kind of necessary. Yeah, because, uh, and, and you have to, psychologically, uh, you have to be able to deal with rejection. Hmm. That isn't really rejection, but yep. you didn't get the gig. Yep. Okay. Yeah, All right. Go on. Go on. Next one. Go on to the next one. Well, you do what people like Jeremy Webb did in Halifax. Jeremy created stuff. 
he created a one-man Christmas carol, which he did every year for 15 years. Mm. You know, he did a one-man Shakespeare thing. Mm. He just creates and creates. And that's, that's what you got to do. Slightly different tack. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier producing Canadian plays. Mm -hmm. um, so we need a, a pool of writers yes. doing this. And there's the, the Playwrights Union of Canada. Is that yes. still yeah. humming? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I'm always fascinated how our education system at times will focus on American written plays and not. So, my rant would be why are they doing Death of a Salesman for the hundredth time? Like, it's been 50 years. Surely, to goodness, in Canada, there's some great Canadian content, and we should be showing that to our students and integrating yeah. that. Can yeah. you, because you've lived that. Yeah. You, you've watched where oh, yeah. writers surface and they can't get their plays performed. Yeah. Well, interestingly, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, deciding that, that uh, I uh, can't pop off and leave Ruth with 4,000 or 5,000 books to deal with. So I started calling, and I took all my theater books and I donated them to the library system. But I had also, I had 90 copies of the original edition of our play, Frankenstein, with the, uh, with the novel as well. Clark Irwin published it. So I gave it to the library on the condition that they would put one in every school library. Who knows? Yeah. Never, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Playwrights Canada, uh, you can get virtually any play that's been written in Canada through them. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them are not written by Norm Foster. <laughs> so, I mean, if you, can yeah. imagine, you know, Norm got the order of Canada on Friday. Oh, no, yeah, I yeah. did not know. Yeah, he did. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Well, good for Norm. That's good for Norm. And he's moved back to Fredericton. Yes, that I was aware of. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we do need to trumpet our playwrights because we have a large, substantial canon now. Yes. We, we really do. It's there. Yep. And it's available. It's just getting it out there. Getting it out there, yeah. yeah. So, so do you have any clues as to how we could do that? Well, uh, uh I think part of it is our things like the young company going around to the schools, talking to the teachers, and part of their message is not just going in and doing that 45 minute performance mm -hmm. for the kids. Mm -hmm. It's what they do for the teachers mm -hmm. and making the teachers aware of what's available. I think that's one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Or at least it's, it's a step. Yep. It's a step. It, does there exist um, a place, a theater, I'm thinking of maybe Stratford, um, but they kind of have a, a formula that they stay within for their summer theaters. Yeah. Is there a place in Canada where it features Canadian um, playwrights? So think of Toronto International Film Festival, yeah. and, and there'll be a whole cadre of films yeah. listed yeah. up and in the support that went yeah. for that. Is there a uh, parallel in the theater world? There are world? places, yeah. Uh, theater Orangeville. Uh, I think has only done one non-Canadian play in the 18 years that David Nairn has been running it. Right. And he's also developed a number of playwrights over those years. Uh, Blythe Festival. Okay. Been going forever. Nothing but Canadian, Canadian plays. plays. Yeah. So there are places. And now you have the Foster Festival in St. Catharines. Okay. It's in, just finished its second year. So, yeah, there are things that are happening Think we could create one down in Atlantic Canada? Well, uh, I had hoped that the Foster Festival would be here. Okay. You know, but uh, we didn't own the playhouse anymore. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, while well, seeing as we're talking about the playhouse, let's wander into that because yeah. you have um, strong and thoughtful views uh, about the building. And, and maybe you can also integrate, you know, what the Imperial did in St. John and what mm -hmm. the Capitol's done in Moncton yeah. and in what Fredericton's proposing to do. Because that all speaks to the home base where Absolutely. performances start to happen. In, in the sports world, it would be the arena yeah. or the stadium. Um, and facilities are important for the kind of production that can happen in that space. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, the first thing that I would like people to remember is that the Playhouse was a gift to the people of the province of New Brunswick by Lord Beaverbrook. Mm -hmm. Just like the art gallery, which is a couple of years older. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a concern that 
when I look at the energy of the board of the art gallery and what they've achieved in terms of that building and adding on and programming and that, a concern about the leadership that has happened at the playhouse since the city took it over, because nothing has happened. Now, in terms of the physical facility, and I learned a long time ago that if you want a consultant, then you want a consultant who will tell you what you want to be told. Hmm. First rule, <laughs> if you're using the sentence. And there's a bit of that. I don't want to be too heavy on it, but I am not against the new performing arts center. Hmm. I am against the new performing arts center at the expense of the playhouse. I think the playhouse should be refitted and can be refitted. They did it with the capital. Mm -hmm. That was a renovation, mm -hmm. and it cost them, I think, $5 million at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, the Imperial, that was a complete rebuild. They gutted yeah, it, they got it down, it. and they spent up to $15, 16000000 million. On it. And they're now uh, raising money to do some improvement work to it after it's been open for a, a number of years now. Uh, but these buildings were saved. These buildings were saved. One of the earliest theaters in this town is the Opera House, where they tore out a wonderful 350-seat theater and put in a council chamber. Hmm. They should restore that. You'd be happy to be without the I'd council chamber? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, here's what I think. Uh, instead of the idea of going out and building something, 50, 60 million dollars, hmm. and uh, you know that whatever the price they say it is going to be, that will not be the price because my father was a plumbing and heating contractor mm -hmm. and he knew about how to do an estimate. He told me the first thing you do is you look at the job. Then you makes a guess, then you doubles it, adds a hundred, and that's about half enough. <laughs> so the same thing still applies. Mm -hmm. Instead of going that route, take the $14 million, refit the playhouse, and then look at the Justice Building. The Justice Building used to be Teachers College. When it was Teachers College, it had an 1,100-seat auditorium with the stage. I performed on that stage in the Red and Black Review. Uh, the Canadian players, when they came through, always played there. It was the performance center. Now, that space could be rejigged to have classrooms, a 300-seat theater, a 110-seat black box, dance studios, a cafe. Mm -hmm. It's on Main Street. Mm -hmm. It's the perfect space. The Playhouse issue, it's wonderful, mm -hmm. nice des description. So what is it that the Playhouse needs, in your view, for its renovation? And what are the obstacles? Oh, uh, the electrical and mechanical system. When we did the big renovations and put on the fly gallery, uh, in 1970, 71, uh, we knew then that the electrical and mechanical systems would need in time to be replaced. We upgraded them as much as we could at that time. Mm -hmm. We were slaves to the fact that they were on the government heating system. Okay. Right from the Centennial Building, it ran right through a tunnel underneath and went, in fact, into the Lord Beaverbrook Hotel. Yep. Uh, so uh, whether that's still there or not, I don't know. But that all needs to be upgraded. Uh, there is cosmetic work, of course. Uh, so the major thing is the heating, air conditioning. That's the big, and the electrical system. That's the big thing. Uh, in terms of insulation and that, well, hey, you can do that or you don't. You know, it's survived for 50 years mm -hmm. with the brickwork that's there. Um, what about thoughts on new technology and performing? Oh, so to keep the building humming 365 oh, yeah. days a year, you need oh, certain yeah. infrastructure technology. Absolutely. Um, interestingly, Orangeville just got uh, an 80,000 grant from the Trillium Foundation, and I think they raised another 100 from someplace else. And they've redone the entire lighting system, which is now totally automated. Okay. Yeah. It's just amazing what they can do. You don't have to go change gels anymore. You yeah. can just do it all there. All the cameras move, uh, all the lighting fixtures move. It's yeah. just amazing. And that's just one thing. I mean, uh, what Marshall was doing uh, with the video uh, stuff for his sets, okay. and that is 
amazing. You, you would think that there was a living room in some of this technology that's out there now. And, and what is it? Is it a 3D projection of a Oh, yeah. Room? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It's just amazing. Hmm. Just amazing stuff. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and they need to update them and bring in that kind of material, too. So in some, you know, very much so, your perspective is grounded in the deep history you have. Yeah. Uh, with the place and knowing how it started in the first place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know... Uh, I can be accused of, of uh, being an old wishy-washy romantic about the place because I spent so many years there. Uh, but there are things there. I mean, can you imagine going into Mexico City and tearing down one of Diego Rivera's murals? Mm -hmm. There would be outrage. Mm -hmm. Well, we in Fredericton have what is probably the largest public art mural in Canada. The Fly Tower, mm -hmm. designed by Tom Forrestal. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are they going to do with that? Just knock it down? Share, they... share the story of what that means. Oh, uh, well, when when uh, we were doing this, Fred Levensall, who was the architect, said, well, there's no way you're going to hide a 40-foot high Fly Tower on top of that Georgian sort of building. And... Uh, it's white. We got to do something with it. And if you if you can't hide it, then you got to draw attention to it, positively. So he said, "Well, we should uh, commission an artist to do something with it." Here's this wonderful canvas. So we commissioned Tom Forrestal, and Tom looked at it, went away, and came back with a number of proposals, some involving metal sculptures and this that. And we looked at it in terms of weight and in terms of durability and in terms of maintenance and we rejected all the proposals that I come up and Tom in frustration said well what in the name of God what is it a bunch of artists trying to make a decision yeah what <laughs> what, what is this thing and uh, I said well Tom it's it's like a kid opening a present on Christmas morning it's a it's a Christmas box Tom went away and he came back and that was the sketch was these broad bands of color, ribbons of color. That was the Christmas box and the present was what was happening underneath on the stage. Mm -hmm. You came to see it. Mm -hmm. you know? So there's, that's one major piece of art that's there. The other one is in the front of the lobby. If you walk in and you look up, there's a mural by Sidney Smith and people who know the mural know who all the individuals were based on. And there's Lord Beaverbrook, and there's so-and-so, and there's so-and-so. And it's there. You tear it down. I don't know. What do you do? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the concern about, well, if you do a major renovation or a refit to the playhouse, you'd have to close it. What are we going to do then? Well, a cold sedan is there. The black box is there. Mm -hmm. The TMB has got its smaller space. Uh, you got Aiken Center for big attractions. Mm -hmm. We had none of that when we closed her in 1970. Yeah. We went out to base gauge stop. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So I think that I think uh, I think the Sailor Heads will probably come around to finding a solution that doesn't involve tearing her down. It would be an interesting moment to have a large community conversation. Um, and, and to open it up, uh, so a picture of four or five hundred people uh, gathered together mm -hmm. to say, okay, our responsibility here is to help solve this um, conundrum. Yeah. Uh, respect for the past. How do we break in the future? Um, how do we move New Brunswick or Fredericton forward? Uh, that dynamic exists in several yeah. different themes. Uh, yeah. I went to uh, uh, one of those uh, public meetings at the convention center. It must have been about, I don't know, 50 people there. Yeah. Uh, but it, the answers had already been determined. Yeah. Yeah, so it was an authentic, open what, public meeting. Was not, mm. was not. It was guided, yeah, okay. to the conclusion that we need a new place and get rid of this one. It's too expensive. Oh, well, you can start a revolution. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I can do the old what, sit on the steps when the bulldozers there come. Why not? You might draw a little attention. <laughs> <laughs> That would be a piece of performance art. Yes, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Oh, the, um, 
Do you have, uh, we have about 10 minutes left, yeah. five, 10 minutes left. On, um, do you have some anecdotes you'd like to share? Um, you've had a whole lifetime. You've managed to carve a career in this. Yeah. And, and it becomes an example for others to follow. Do you have lessons or teachings that you could offer to young aspiring actors, playwrights, um, theater production people? Well, uh, other than don't do what I did? No. no. <laughs> but um, I would say go with your heart, not your head. Okay. You know. Uh, I look at my dear friend Ed Mullally, who's wonderful, wonderful. Uh, had a career, retired from the university just a few years ago. And uh, I was on a tenure track teaching philosophy at Memorial University. When I got a call from my old mentor, Alvin Shaw, who was the Dean of Arts in UNB at the time, saying, Walter, they're looking for a new general manager for the Playhouse. If you're interested, you should apply. And I said, Alvin, I don't want to run a building. What do you want to do with this? Well, if I were involved, I'd, I'd, I'd want to have a theater company, you know. And he said, well, tell them that. So I applied. And I came to Fredericton to be interviewed. And another dear friend, uh, John Hobday, who was the general manager at Neptune, was also applied. And we were being interviewed. And the board at that time was quite small. I think uh, Max uh, Aiken, and, or uh, uh, not Max, <laughs> the son, uh, and uh, Lady Aiken were the custodians. And then they had Dr. Bud Jewett, representing the citizens, was a, a member, a president. D.C. Campbell, tractors and equipment, was on there. Uh, a little guy named Louis Robichaud was on there. Jack Main from the Beaver Book Foundation was on there. Alvin Shaw, representing the university. So anyway, I came and I had this interview, and I said, you know, really, uh, if I came here, I, I'd want to start a theater company. And somebody, I don't know which one, said, well, Fine, go ahead, as long as it doesn't cost us any money. So I did my first summer season, and we made $100.22. And on the basis of that, I went after the Beaver Book Foundation and went around the province trying to put together something that became Theatre New Brunswick. Yeah, so the heart. Probably heart. Yeah, except that, that now, you know, when you hit, 78 or 79 and you don't have a pension and you think my god academics retired 85 percent pensions of their salary and you've had 10 years of the full professor oh my goodness <laughs> and you're going up to thunder bay to play santa Claus. exactly <laughs> <laughs> but that but that's, they changed it yeah exactly they changed it no it's uh, i've been a very very lucky and blessed person this is a great place for us to stop good sir thank you so much my pleasure and thank you for tuning in. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.